Hello and welcome to Africa Today. I am Mike Okwache. Now, many say the rule of law and democracy are the cornerstones of good governance. But what sounds good in theory often looks different in practice. Now, according to the Mo Ibrahim Index of African Governance, Africa has experienced widespread development and improved economic opportunities since 2000. But the rule of law has deteriorated in a number of countries. Now, a report by the Institute for Security Studies claimed that South Africa is facing increased lawlessness born out of corruption as its governance, uh, government and struggles to provide an effective response to the country's problems. In the lawless heart of Africa, or Horn of Africa, the, Lord, the Lord's Resistance Army has uh, found a safe haven in the Central African Republic to operate and uh, recruit child soldiers. Elsewhere, where there are rebels in DRC in the Congo, Darfur in Sudan, as well as Islamist extremists in Mali, Nigeria, and Somalia. What are your thoughts on the level of lawlessness in Africa? Talk to us on Twitter at TVC Africa Today or send an email to Africa Today at TVCnews.tv. We'll take this report on the law enforcement in Kenya and Africa Today. We'll be right back. Welcome on board. Waving placards that illustrated their outrage, these activists are particularly angered that the suspects were set free after being ordered to cut grass as punishment. We are demanding for justice. And how, how can this justice be reached? Can we have the perpetrator for, for the, go for the full process of the law? Because most of the time we have, have people using money and they end up... Yet uh, the law end up not, not working. So at the end of the, the, the day, you see these people left alone. And if they are, they, they are released without being charged, then I'm very sure tomorrow I'll be the next victim. They took the case to the country's police boss, marching to deliver a petition demanding the re-arrest and a new prosecution of the suspects. The details are gruesome. The protesters say the girl was walking home from her grandfather's funeral when she was attacked by six men and later dumped in a pit latrine. The attack left her with serious injuries to her back, a double fistula, and she is now confined to a wheelchair. She will never walk again. The issue of violence against women is not only the issue for Kenya. It is happening everywhere, surprisingly enough. With all the obligations that our governments have, it continues to be something that is not able to, to, to end. Kenya is notorious for these type of attacks. A joint report by the Kenyan government and United Nations showed that nearly one in every three girls experience sexual violence before they are 18. But these agitators won't let those facts deter them. I think this is one step, but we still have a long way to go. Um, it's nice to see that the, um, our petition, which had over 1.2 million signatures, was received by the office of the Inspector General, even though it wasn't the Inspector General himself. Um, and, and I'm also assured that they've asked us to come in for a sit-down meeting, because I think this is the opportunity now to sit down with them and set up benchmarks and timeframes and timelines um, and see how we can work together to strengthen the system that have um, that have not protected us but as with such cases that attract social stigma rape is rarely reported and the lack of faith in the police and the criminal justice system has further helped in deepening a web of criminality that allows sexual assault pass for a norm Right, glad to have you back. The Mo Ibrahim Foundation defines governance as the provision of the political, social and economic public goods and services that a citizen has the right to expect from his or her state. Many say Africa has become a place where those who should uphold the law are lawless, while those whom the law has failed take laws into their own hands. To discuss the issue of governance and rule of law and lawlessness in Africa today, we have Jafet Omojua, a brand ambassador and a lecturer at the Free University of Berlin in Germany. It's good to have you today. The pleasure is mine. You're welcome. You're welcome to thank the program. You. And welcome home too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> right. And later on the show, we'll be linking up with Chadwin Harris, a political analyst in South Africa. He'll be uh, joining us later on on the show. Now, let's start it this way. When you talk about uh, Africa and you talk about lawlessness, it seems there's a correlation between the two, where the laws are set as, uh, that's, uh, laid down don't really function as they're supposed to be. Mm, I think it, it's, it's unfair on Africa to, to say something like that. Um, we would always have issues of lawlessness, and this happens actually all over the world. Mm. 
But first of all, we shouldn't even put Africa in a box. We okay. have about 54 independent countries in Africa, minus mm -hmm. the, the colonies that, that are not independent, and all of these countries have their issues. Mm -hmm. But I think um, today, compared to where we used to be, we, we are actually in a better society. That is not to say that lawlessness doesn't hold. I mean, I, I heard the statistics. We all know about the Islamists in Kenya, mm. in Nigeria, in areas of Mali, mm. and actually Somalia, in Algeria and all, all, over the, mm. all over the continent, more or less. But um, it's not, you don't define Africa in terms of lawlessness. It's just one of the realities of Africa. The same okay. way we've seen situations where the law actually takes its course. But of course, we always want a better society. We always want things to get better. We always want change. But we should be careful not to make it look like um, Africa is essentially an, like it's an African thing. Lawless, no, oh. it's not. All right. Mm. Now, when it comes to when it comes from every facet of life, I guess there are laws guiding every aspect of our living, as the case may be. But there's always a difference between what exists on the books and what is on ground. Uh, that's unfortunate because what exists on the books can be doctored, can be corrected, can be edited, and you can do anything with it. But, but life is different. Life is life. <laughs> life plays out live. Mm -hmm. there, everything just happens like that. But um, as a people, as a society, we must always be conscious of trying to improve what we have. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are societies that would never be satisfied with even so-called excellence because they always believe that it can be done better, it can be done faster, it can be done in, in a way that's um, was not done last year, so we should just always strive to make things better. But let's not um, expect that we would always have things the way they are on paper. It's always <laughs> going to be different. The only place you can get perfection is on paper. <laughs> uh, well, and maybe, maybe in heaven. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> For those who believe that. All right, joining us from South Africa is Chadwin Harris. Uh, he is a political analyst uh, joining us from South Africa. Now, Harris, if you can hear me... Uh, you have been following the, the state of lawlessness on the continent from the length and breadth of, of the entire continent. Now, apart from that, the Moibam Index on African Governance has rated Africa low on the rate on the rule of law. What, what do you make of the situation on the continent? All right, Chadwin, can you hear me? If you can hear me, I'm welcoming you to the program. And uh, I'm saying that the Moe Brahim Index on African Governance has rated Africa low on the rule of law. What do you make of the situation on the continent? Well, it's, it's different for different parts of the continent. I mean, obviously, there have been some new developments uh, in Africa that have affected this cause. Um, for example, the instability in the Middle East, I think, has had a knock-on effect on East Africa and other African countries vulnerable to the, the threat from Islamic uh, terrorism. Um, but in other parts of Africa, the, the picture looks a lot better. In, in my region, for example, southern Africa, uh, things seem to have been getting better. I mean, we had news uh, just last week about uh, the developments in the DRC, for example, which has been a, a problem in southern Africa. Um, if I look at the, the southern African countries that have scored lowest, on the Ibrahim Index, uh, if you look at Zimbabwe, we understand that they've been instable or oh, unstable for a while, but they've had uh, an election recently, and it looks like things are going to get back to normal there. Uh, Madagascar's just also had an election for the it's the first legitimate election since 2009. So I think there are challenges, but there are parts of Africa that show that there is hope in terms of our, our governance uh, scores and ratings. All right. Now, in the southern part of Africa, there has been widespread lawlessness in recent times. What do you think is responsible for this trend? Uh, sorry, just repeat that there's been widespread what? I was saying that in the southern parts of, of the continent, in southern Africa, there seem to be widespread lawlessness from gang riots to different kind of things, as the case may be. But what do you think is responsible for this trend? I don't know that I would describe what's happening in Southern Africa as lawlessness. Now, I mean, uh, granted, there are some issues, uh, for example, in South Africa with crime, uh, with service delivery protests, with civil disobedience. Uh, but I think you must be careful to not to equate that with lawlessness. I think if you look at the democracies in Southern Africa, uh, they are maturing and are developing judicial systems and systems of law and order that generally have control over the entire population. So I think it's dangerous to, to say that there's lawlessness that's, uh, you know, becoming more or increasing in southern Africa. All right. Okay. We'll, we'll come back to you again. Stay on the line. Thank you. 
And that's Chadwin from uh, South Africa. Now, let's, let's come back to you. Now, there's, there's, who do we hold responsible for this, the trend of lawlessness in parts of the continent? Because sometimes we hear of uh, gang, uh, some gangs are fighting others on the streets, as the case may be. There's strip bullets hit uh, uh, innocent children and women and so on. There are issues of rape here and there and so on. Who do we hold responsible for all of this? We hold the society responsible. Who is the society? That's, that's it. Um, the society is the individual, then the family, mm. then the church, the mosque, the schools, then the societies, um, co conventional organizations, then the government. Because it's easy to say you hold governments responsible, but we are the government. We are the ones that elect people. So if we elect the wrong people who eventually refuse to, make, to apply and enforce the law, then we are all part of the system. So we hold the society responsible. But apart from that, essentially and critically, if you have to point at an institution, then of course you hold the government responsible because the government is responsible for enforcing law, for making the laws, for making sure that whoever breaks the law um, gets to be punished. Any society, whether a country or a continent, where the, the laws and principles of incentives and disincentives do not hold, that society would always suffer lawlessness. Let me explain. If I break the law and I don't get punished, then the society is essentially saying it is right to break the law. Mm -hmm. If I kill people, or maybe as a terrorist or as a kidnapper, and the government of that society says that they want to negotiate with me for me to stop killing people, then we are saying that when it happens tomorrow, we will negotiate with them. So we have to be careful with the president. And if, if I steal money and, and, and I go to jail and the president of my country um, offers me um, a, a state pardon, then we are saying that if you steal big enough money for the president to recognize you, then you might, if you, even if you go to jail, you might be pardoned. The society, the government, institutions, we must be careful with every step we make because there is no decision that is singular. Every decision has an effect on the future. Mm -hmm. Governance is a cascading reality and everything we do is a way of telling, especially the young generation, young people coming up to say, this is right or this is wrong. And this is right and this is wrong is not what we tell them in the morning. This is right and this is wrong. What we do as adults and it's also what we do as a government in terms of how we punish um, the wrong things and how we reward the right things. All right, now we, 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 we often often hear sometimes of extrajudicial killings by law enforcement, either the police, the soldiers, and so on. And sometimes when, when, they, when they apprehend um, uh, accused or alleged terrorists or robbers, as the case may be, sometimes. And we often hear of uh, uh, sometimes jungle justice by people on the, youth on the streets as well. Now, in this kind of situation, one will feel that it should have acted as deterrent to other people to carry out that act. But is it not complicating the entire um, trend or activity? The, 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 primary, the primary phenomenon in a society is mm. the law. Yeah. And if the law does not hold, nothing else would hold. So if we use jungle, and putting justice behind jungle, is, is, you can see the contradiction. <laughs> jungle justice is never going to be justice. Mm. Jungle justice would never stop um, people from being criminals. Um, extrajudicial killing would, is never, I mean, is, I mean, it's not going to be justice. Mm. People must be found to be guilty before they are made to, um, to be punished. You don't just um, pass anyone to be guilty right there on the spot and just pass the judgment and just kill the person, whether with a gun of a policeman or with the gun of an armed robber or the gun of um, some, some young people, rowdy, rowdy crowd. Yeah. So that's, that's, I think that's just it. But do you think people are losing faith in the standards? It's a reflection. It's a, I, I, I told you about the cascading effects of this. It's a reflection of the fact that people have lost trust in the system. Because in, in some societies, you, you would think that um, if, you think, if you take a thief to the police station, the right thing would be done. But you wake up two days later, the same person that the people arrested and took to the police station, um, is the one committing the crime again. So it, it just happens that eventually people will lose faith in the system, they will lose faith in the ability of the system to meet out justice. And when that happens, the natural cause takes effect, which means that the people will not decide to, to deliver the justice by themselves. And when that happens, you already know that you're talking about the unconventional ways of passing mm -hmm. judgment, which is the extrajudicial killings, the mob killings, and, and all of those things. So it still boils down to government doing the right thing at the right time. When they don't, there are always effects to those things. There are always consequences. Okay, but we'll come back to this. Now, many say lawlessness is not just about the disregard of the law or the absence of law enforcement. Rather, it is the failure of government. We'll go on a quick break in Africa today. We'll be right back. Stay with us.
All right, it is believed that something transformational has to be or, ha or has been happening online in Africa. Now, many say Twitter, Facebook, and other forms of social media have uh, revolutionized political discourse and rewritten the rules of economic dialogue. Now, let me come back to you. What, what the, you are a young person, for instance, as a case may be, and you've worked with all sort of uh, so you, the social media and so on. What role does the social media play? in enlightening the people against lawlessness on one hand, or maybe even enhancing lawlessness? So, social media has deregulated power. <laughs> social media has deregulated responsibility. Okay. Social media has leveled the playing ground of politics and governance and democracy. Mm. Social media is probably the best thing to have happened to democracy on the continent. Because more than ever before, anyone with access to the internet can express his or her opinion on issues. People can have debates. Of course, they can get to insult themselves sometimes, but they can have debates. They can, they can argue. They can. I think that um, it, 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 it's the beauty of where we are as a people that today you don't need to spend weeks getting a, a political editor of a newspaper to publish your article mm -hmm. or even a big time TV station to get to read your, your story online. All you need to do is just tweet it or blog it or um, Facebook it. And so for me, I think it's, it's, we're moving forward. I'm, 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 I'm very op optimistic. I'm a naturally optimistic person. And you don't even have to be optimistic to see that there is, there is change, and that change is there. And I think that um, it, it also allows for us to know more about ourselves. Because if I know more about you, it, it's, the chances of me loving you and respecting your rights um, get to increase. So social media would, in a way, reduce lawlessness. Because now you're able to see that the world is much more better with listening to other people's opinion, with debating and engaging, and you know, being rational and just following logic and not using muscles and brawn to, to get your way. It's OK. Now, we still have uh, Chadwin Harris from South Africa. Chadwin, uh, l let me ask you this. Now, do you think African governments are doing, or government institutions are doing enough to uphold the rule of law on the continent? Look, I want to take it back to what you were discussing earlier, which mm. is the issue of trust. And I think the important thing for government is to win the trust of especially their, their young citizens. Now, in connection with what you said about social media, I think what the African continent needs to learn is to find examples of people who are held accountable for their actions, regardless who they were. Because an important part of rule of law is the principle that everyone is equal before the law regardless of how powerful you are. So what I would like to see more of is examples in Africa of former leaders held accountable for what they've done in the past. Now, there are some good examples of that. I mean, you have, you have trials going on at the moment in uh, Zambia, Malawi, of uh, former rulers who are being investigated for what they've done in their term of office. But you also have another tendency in Africa to want to protect leaders. For example, you saw the AU response uh, to the ICC case against the Kenyan president. Hmm. So I think the way to win the youth trust is to show that everyone is equal before the law. And right. the way to do that is to keep leaders responsible. All, all right, Chad, but let, let me ask you this. You talked about social media now. Supposing we, we have an issue, uh, maybe someone blew a whistle. There's a whistleblower on, on, uh, on a social media and people bec it becomes public knowledge. Uh, how does that translate into holding leaders accountable, for instance? Well, I think you can't stop the flow of information. It's going to, if something happens today because of social media, it will become public knowledge. And I think that the quicker African citizens can benefit from that, the better. I don't think we should be worrying about, you know, who should be held responsible for spreading information. Hmm. Information is free and uh, information needs to be faulting its way through to citizens who finally have another medium to show them exactly what's going on in terms of their leadership. All right. Now, many blame leaders for the lawlessness in their countries as a kid. But what role do the people have to play in all of this? Now, of course, we can't simply blame the leadership. What I was saying is that the people need to learn the importance of having faith in the justice system. And part of that is going after wrongdoing, whoever does it, however powerful you are. But there's also a lot to be said about um, the social structure in Africa. So, for example, our, our family is doing enough to, to raise uh, children with the right modality to understand the difference between right and wrong. 
uh, our civil society organizations, uh, churches, you know, all the other people besides government and politicians, are they playing their part in the rule of law in society? Okay. Th thank you, Chadwin, for joining us on the program today. Thank you. Now, he mentioned, uh, he talked about the family. And uh, I remember earlier, you talked about the church, the mosque, and all of that, those um, social institutions and, and all of that. But starting from the family, do you think the family has failed? You, you look at the society, the society gives you the answer. Mm. Because the family is a microcosm of the society. Mm. Every individual, every terrorist that became a terrorist, every... Um, kidnapper that became a kidnapper, every murderer that became a murderer, every rapist that became a rapist, started from a family. So if we think... And in fact, has a family has somewhere. Has a family somewhere. <laughs> so if we see the society, the society gives us the answer. The society is a reflection of the, the collection of the different families. Mm. So we, it's really very important that we pay attention to the family. We, we, we like to solve problems in a big way. We have grand ideas of how we solve societal problems. But we need to just pay attention sometimes to these simple things. And I think the simple thing in this equation is the family. Has the family failed? That question is difficult because we have 1.1 billion people on the continent and we have, that means we have millions of families. Some yeah. families have failed. Some families, of course, are, have not failed. The family that brought me up has not failed because I'm <laughs> turning out to be good, just like your family and the families of other young Africans mm. um, representing the continent in a big way. Mm. Of course, the families of the murderers and these terrorists have failed. Collectively, then we have to take responsibility because I think things are not good enough. We have to do better. But I, have, I also have to admit that things are much more better than they used to be. But of course, like life would want us to do it. We need to just keep improving and keep demanding better of ourselves, keep de demanding better of the society and keep demanding better of families. All right. I want to talk about the, the indices of, say, poverty and illiteracy. How do they, how do they affect or translate into anybody becoming lawless, for instance? They, they are everything. Abraham Maslow has, um, Abraham Maslow's um, pyramid of needs basically settles the question. If a man does not have food, if a woman does not have clothing, if a boy or girl does not have a house over his head, they would have to do anything to get it. They would have to buy, they would have to um, sell their votes. Sometimes they may have to kill to get it. Sometimes they may have to crawl and walk Look, the society must deal with hunger. The society must deal with housing. The society must make sure that the majority of the people are, are moved away from that least level of the Maslow, Maslow ladder. If that doesn't happen, we can cry about corruption, but we cannot continue to cry about corruption if we keep using, um, having the same things that are feeding, because corruption is a shoot. Not, there's a root that, 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 that brings about corruption. We need to deal with these roots. And one of these roots is the fact that people are hungry, people are poor, and people need better lives. And if you don't answer these questions that these things are, that are asking, then we have to answer these questions through lawlessness, one way or the other. That's all right. Now, uh, the Mo Ibrahim Index that gives us indica indicators on, on how this, on, on how a pandemic, this, some of these indices are, as the case may be, it's like a benchmark. But it seems after African leaders and even African people are not really consulting to get to know, okay, we have to do this to um, handle uh, the situation on our hands and all of that. But how should people really um, um, approach this kind of data that is made available? Um, data or no data, we, it's, we, we, we live, we're human beings, we see ourselves, we see what's happening. Mm. So it, before you will start paying attention to data, you have to first of all pay attention to what you can see with your own eyes, mm. because data is a function of research, other people have gathered together. So, it's about the simple things, really. Let's, let each man, deal with, let each man, each woman, deal with his immediate environment, and we will fix the world. I, I really, I, I mean, I, I'm interested in global issues. I'm interested in big answers to problems. But I'm, I'm a believer in simple solutions. I'm a believer in what I, I, I can do to make the world a better place. And I'm, I'm a believer in what you can do. And I think that when we combine our efforts and, and form this Voltron of change, mm. and I think that change will come. Um, of course, people would always pay attention. Some people are selected; uh, they, they would always pay attention to to reports like reports like the Mo Ibrahim. But we we, sh we would not expect the majority of people to because people have their individual problems and challenges and and ambition and stuff like that. So for those that are interested in those things, they should pay attention. But as a as a as a society, as a people, we really have to look at our societies and look at what we can do um, as individuals and as a group, as a family, as a church, as a mosque, as a taste or whatever. All right. Now, what, what do you think is the future of the continent when it comes to 
eradicating lawlessness the where everybody is law abiding, for instance. What do you think is the, the future? The future of Africa is beautiful. Mm. The, and I have no apologies about that because I've been across the continent. I've, I've also met Africans um, outside of the continent. And when you talk about change, the primary ingredient for change is the people. And I think that we are having increasingly Africans that, that desire a better future and not just desire a better future, that are actually working day and night to make that future happen. And more than ever before, we have a young population of Africans demanding for change and ready to participate in the change process. Unlike before, where we had just a few people deciding what affects the, the generation and the old population. Now, it's, there's, there's a huge involvement. There's, there's a huge population of young people participating. And participation would increasingly make things better because now you can demand exactly the kind of governance you want. You can demand who wants to become your governor, who wants to, who wants to become your local government chairman or council chairman or county chairman as they have it in Kenya. It's, it's about participation. So I'm, I'm very, very optimistic about the future of this continent. All right, Jafet Omojua, thank you very much for coming thank on the you. program the today. Is mine. All right, well, we talked with uh, Jafet Omojua, a lecturer with the Free University in Berlin, and we also had uh, Chadwin Harris from South Africa, political analyst. Now, in recent times, lack of basic services such as clean water, sanitation, and electricity are reasons for violent protest and rebellion in most parts of Africa. Now, many say what is needed is a system where the judiciary, the police, the media, and other institutions are made to work for the good of the people. Now, many believe that it will take a collective fight against corruption and holding African leaders accountable to the rule of law. But what do you think is the future of all of this? Let's take the discussion online on Twitter at TVC Africa Today. We'll send an email to Africa Today at tvcnews.tv. Until we come your way again, I am Mike Okoche. And remember, this is Africa. Bye for now.